on the bottom but I've got this piece of wood with some screws sticking up through it to sort of hold it while I'm coating it. Now that gloss is for the uh, for added protection and UV protection on this so I am going to just put one coat on the bottom of this probably unless it dries fast enough then I may put two the top will get three. So I will try to catch up on some videos. It seems like I haven't been making any. And uh, some people are going crazy making videos. So I'm trying to catch up on uh, what you guys are up to. Um, hold on a second. I'm going to go get that varnish. When you're doing stuff like this, you want to use a good brush. This is a Worcester uh, stain and varnish brush. It's a two inch. I guess you can use the chip brushes. Um, I find it's a lot easier if you use a good brush. You only want to dip your brush into it maybe an inch. And the way I do it, I don't know if this is the right way, but I try and get a, a good coat on there, not real heavy, but get coverage, especially with a thick varnish like this. And then uh, I'll show you how you make sure to get uh, your overlapping brush strokes out of it. Basically what you do after you get it coated is you take the brush at a real steep angle like this and Make sure there's some material on the brush and drag it real nice and even end to end. And that tends to get the brush strokes out of it. This stuff is pretty thick, so it flows for a long time. You gotta watch not to get too much material on it. It's like oil based paint. Um, if you get too much material on it, it's, it flows for such a long time that it will run. But uh, anyway, getting back to watching some videos and trying to catch up, um, Greg asked if guys would make uh, welding cart videos, so I did that earlier in the week. And uh, nice to see there was a good response to that. Those will go up on the YouTube Garage um, channel, so you can uh, click on, I'm sure he'll have a playlist of those and uh, for the new guys who are uh, looking for that sort of information um, if you go to that channel Greg's doing an awesome job of setting that up so that you can watch you know several uh, videos, I mean I know when you type into YouTube if you're looking for a certain thing um, it'll give you a playlist, but these playlists will be from YouTube Garage Guys. And uh, if you're following what we're doing, and you like what we're doing, and you like the way the information is presented, you can go there, and there might be something there that you didn't even think to look for. And, uh, you can click on those and you can watch as many or as few as you want to watch and uh, get a whole lot of information all in one one stop shop
So we're just trying to get this thing covered for now. I've got to get this thing done. This boat's, um, I'm going to take it up and put it in this week sometime here. It's the other reason I'm putting the Japan dryer in this stuff. When I first got the boat, like seven years ago, I refinished all the wood and every morning when I'd come to work, I'd put a coat on it. Actually morning and evening. But I don't have that kind of time right now. I'm kind of in the time constraint here. I'm so busy at work. Probably shouldn't be working this weekend, but I, just, I can't make any time during the week to, to mess with this. And it's one of those things for me, it's a labor of love. I want to make sure it's real nice. All right, we're tipping. This is called tipping. If you drag the brush too fast or if there's, if the brush is too dry, it'll start to drag the material with it. Uh, the other thing, when you put that Japan dryer in it, it sort of reduces your open time with it or your uh, your time where you can get dust in it which is nice in a way but it also uh, it makes it so that um, your brush strokes don't flow out as good so I, I don't know that I recommend this stuff for somebody who has never uh, done any varnishing, I mean practice, because varnish is pretty forgiving stuff um, if you're patient with it. And a lot of the varnishes you're supposed to, you know, sand it with 220 or 320 or whatever the, the piece sheets say to do with it. And you're supposed to sand that in between coats. Well, this particular one it's not required. I'm trying to get it in the end grain in there too, even though I'm gonna have sealant all around this. This boat is a nineteen eighty nine, so twenty two years old. Twenty three years old. And this uh this tea bow pulpit is original to the boat. Now you can oil them, but I find on something that is not easy to take on and off so that you can do it inside. Um, it's kind of a pain to do it on the boat. I don't like doing it that way. Plus, if there's any oxidation in the gel coat, that teak oil will stain the daylights out of it. So we, tr I try to do stuff off of the boat when it comes to woodwork whenever I can. It's just too big of a mess. Too much preparation work. I mean, when you're doing a car, you have it in a garage, it's in a relatively controlled environment. Um, it's not scorching hot out. You know, you can mask it off. You start putting masking tape on a boat that's getting beat up out in the sun, and too bad I masking tape off of it. So I'm going to flip this. Sorry guys, I'm going to block the camera here. But and that's the way I do it. I, don't, I always do the bottom first because where I have those spikes sticking up, and they'll poke it, but it's on the bottom side. So I really don't care, because you won't see any of that. And there's not a lot going on around here other than work. Lots of landscape work going on here. The weather's, we haven't had a lot of rain or anything. Maybe we've had a couple good storms, but I wouldn't say that I'm uh, completely buried at this point because the weather's been cooperating. So I'm pretty happy about that. I'm 
sure that can all change at any point here. sides and these edges done so that once I get to the top areas I don't have a bunch of um, uncovered spots because the top is what I really need to focus on to make sure it's nice. I like the, the matte finish of the of this tinted stain protectant, whatever you want to call it. But this just, uh, this finishes it off. So it would be like uh, not putting clear on your base coat. This just gives it that added pop. I always enjoyed uh, refinishing the teak on my other boats I've had. I had a boat with a whole swim platform was teak, and I kept it scrubbed and oiled constantly, but we're in the north here, so on the Great Lakes, the teak holds up pretty well, I'm sure, in the south, where the sun is just absolutely scorching, and in salt water even, that it wouldn't hold up. This stuff holds up really good. I made it seven years on my first redo of this bow pulpit and now that I'm doing the uh, anchor windlass on the boat and I have this off and I've decided to refinish it um, I probably I, I don't have any intention of having the boat another seven years I will probably have a different boat by then hopefully something a little bigger this boat's uh, listed as a 30, but it's probably about 33 overall. And I'd like to have something just a little bit bigger, a little bit more beam. This is another one of those things I enjoy doing the work. I don't mind doing gel coat work either. Um, color matching gel coat is an art. I'm not great at it. But uh, there's a company out there called Spectrum that make the factory color gel coats for the boats. And uh, they're real close with their colors. Um, you need to, almost need to tint whatever they give you to get it as close as you can so that your color match is as best as it can be and usually what ends up happening once the gel coat starts to oxidize over time I mean I don't care how much wax you put on a boat it's going to oxidize uh, they end up matching in time so the closer you get it in the beginning the better off you're going to be so I'm kind of rambling about that stuff. Obviously, I'm not doing that kind of work right now. So um, it's hard to see. I'm sure the camera's not picking it up, but there's a lot of lines in this from the brush strokes, which I'm not sweating it. This stuff flows really good. I think I had three or five coats on this originally. I mean, seven years, that's a long time. And if I was a smart guy, I'd make a piece of canvas and put some snaps on this so you could cover it up and keep the UV light off of it. And it would probably last forever because I have a teak railing that runs around the transom of the boat. And that teak railing looks almost as good as it did when it was first done because the canvas covers it except for during the day when you have it unsnapped. So, I'm going to finish tipping this out here. And you basically want to pull your brush right off the edge. If you go too, too fast, 
you put air bubbles in it. And I'm sure there's guys who disagree with me, guys who do this all the time, but this is from my personal experience. This is how I taught myself to do it. Nobody taught me. But you just sort of pick up on it as you go and see how the product works for you. Because, like I said, a very thick product may tell you not to thin it. I couldn't imagine trying to spray it. I'm sure you probably could. But I don't know that I'd want to try it. Now before I did all this, I stripped all the old finish off. I actually used a uh, mud hog with uh, 40 grit on it. And I know that sounds a little overkill for wood, but um, this is put together, I'll show you guys, I don't want to cut this off because it's going to get long. It's made as individual planks. And over time it's, it gets uneven. So I'm sure you guys can see that there's individual planks. Uh, they're probably three quarter inch wide planks and they're put together this way. Well, it gets an uneven surface, so I took the mud hog and I buzzed over that and leveled that all out. And I put some wood putty on it, which you can see the light color in there. That I don't care about so much. Um, it'd be nice if it matched, but it's covered. Uh, and by buzzing over it with that, I was able to strip the finish and level it. And then I took some 80 on the mud hog and uh, got those 40 grit scratches out of it. And then I took some uh, 180 on the DA and did some finish sanding with it. And uh, it smoothed out pretty good. But you can see the reflection of that light's real fuzzy because of the brush strokes. That will level out. Um, in about half an hour, I'll take this outside and put it in the sun after it's flowed out enough. And then it should be good to go. So I will catch up with you guys uh, after a little while here. Um, I'll show you a quick... I'll climb up on the boat here. I'll show you the hole that I had to cut. I don't know if you guys can see this. I've got tape over it. It was supposed to rain last night. But that's the bow pulpit fits into that area. And that's a rope locker. So I had to cut that hole. And that normally I would dig that wood all out of there and fill that with epoxy, thickened epoxy resin so that water couldn't intrude there. It's a little damp now. It's a 20-some year old Sea Ray. What, find me one that's not. Um, this boat, I think I said in my beginning video, I'm not sure, uh, I had to refurbish the whole thing because they put a conduit that runs along the keel of the boat that comes up into this rope locker up to about into here. And that's to run your wiring. Well, Sea Ray and in their infinite wisdom when they built these boats, it was basically a piece of one inch conduit or one inch conduit, one inch PVC, and that the end of it comes out um, in the bilge. Well, they put a cap over it. Well, I'll show you what happens. Maybe this is a design flaw, maybe this is just my theory. Okay, so you have this drain here. This is the bottom of the rope locker. This lets the water out when the rope comes in wet or chain or whatever you got. Well, if that gets plugged up and the boat sits outside all the time and the cover to the rope locker leaks, it'll fill up with water. And when it fills up with water and gets to a certain level, it gets to that conduit, which is inside that rope locker, you know, like I said, about that high. Now when that fills up, then that works like a, a fucking drain. And it runs all the way down the keel underneath the flooring inside the cabin. And then, you know, you get to about, mm, yeah, about where the radar arch is, where the bulkhead is, where it comes through into the engine area back there. Well, if it's got a plug on it, guess what? That water sits in there. Well, we're in Ohio. It freezes. Then that conduit breaks. It was 1-inch Schedule 40 PVC. Well... The rest is ancient history. When that pipe breaks and then that drain continues to be plugged up and it continues to pour water in there from sitting outside in the winter time, 
it fills up underneath the cabin floor which is uh, four pound or eight pound buoyancy foam you do the math on that I found that one out the hard way this boat was a little wet when I got it I wasn't too afraid of it but uh, the cabin needed some repairs and it was a little mildewy so I was just going to reupholster the whole thing I ended up cutting out the whole floor and taking uh, every implement of destruction I could find to get the the soaking wet stinky buoyancy foam out and uh, having to redo the cabin floor in there so I'll take you guys for a walk around on that when I uh, do the next video and uh, we'll gripe about that some more so I'll catch you guys